Welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod once again. A really big weekend of Super Rugby coming up. We've caught some heat, actually, from a few fans <laughs> calling us the Crusaders Rugby Pod. So we're going to try to, you know, show that we do have love for the Hurricanes because obviously there's some Hurricanes fans out there who want, want a little bit more about their team within this show. And we'll try to do our very best for you on that. We've got a big piece of Stephen Pettifetta first five analysis. Chippers getting flash on us this week as well. The Opiki final is going to be massive. The Blues sneak home into top spot. Maratu knock over the Manawa. Blues at home versus the Manawa in the final this weekend. So that's big. A little bit on how you can watch that final on TikTok as well. We'll have your email comments, your YouTube comments, of course, the person who gets the best comment will get to play a sport ball as well. So that to go in the tipping comp before we get any further. James Parsons. How are you? Very well, very well. Excited about a weekend. Of I'm tonight. just fascinated that I've been associated with being a Crusaders uh, podcast fan. <laughs> <laughs> Bryn, you must be just pumping them up too much, mate. I've... I've been spending so much time on Dupla C Carifi or Safa Amour, mate. You've got to give those canes a bit of love, mate. Well, I don't know how much more love I can give them. I told them they'd be the dark horse to win the competition. That's so. true. <laughs> That's true. What more they want? I don't know what more they want from me. Oh, yeah. It's difficult, though, isn't it? You can't please everyone. There's no. all these different 80 teams. 20 rule. Yeah, and, and the Crusaders, to be fair, I mean, if the All Blacks were suddenly 0 and 5, we'd be having the similar conversations week on week. We're talking about the greatest team in the history of Super Rugby, possibly the greatest provincial slash club team to ever play the game. So I apologise oh, if we focused on that. That's going to get more heat. <laughs> the Irish fans and South African bring, fans Bring your arguments. In. Bring your arguments. I'm willing to have them. <laughs> so, but the Hurricanes have been very good and we'll look to do a little bit more on the Hurricanes today. So let's start there, actually, with the viewer question that inspired the intro in that conversation. <laughs> um, very big thank you to Kerry Getson who sent us an email. Uh, perhaps you may consider a name change for the program to Crusaders Rugby Pod. Shouldn't you be focusing on them as what they are doing right now and what they're doing to everyone should be of interest? The same applies to the Chiefs and the Blues as well. So please do better you lose my interest. <laughs> so, <laughs> my question uh, goes, let's start with you, Jipper. Yeah. What makes the Canes so good this year? Um, well, I think we've touched on it in parts, and I'm not being facetious there. I genuinely do think we've touched on it. But they've been so good, you can't labour a point. <laughs> you know, like they've been consistent. Their, big, their biggest change, I believe, is their type five. You know, their, their set piece, um, scrum and line out. We see any team that can't function there, um, you know, is, is, is their biggest change, I believe. On top of that, the breakdown is where the game is won and lost. That loose forward trio, how do you pick it every week? You know, like, it, it, it is the best crop of Lucy's in terms of squad depth mm. um, across the campaign, across New Zealand and Australia and, and Fiji. Um, and then out the back of that, they have got, I suppose, an, an innate ability to put teams under pressure through the defensive line. And it forces a lot of errors and turnovers and they're extremely good off those turnovers. So when they put that line speed pressure, and they're quite short on D, they do leave the outside a hell of a lot. And, and they're not worried about that. They back themselves to cover that or if there's a kick, they've got time to get back there. But they just, like Corey Jane's been running it for a long time. He did himself as a player. Their wingers are high, real high. And, and they, they just bring that pressure and then it forces them to go back inside. Then they've got that forward pack I just mentioned, one to eight, to clean them up. And then they're brutal in that collision area and that breakdown. And they just, teams can't get past, they can't get a roll on. The way attacks need to get a roll on is get in behind that defensive line. They just currently just can't do that. And I do think their defence is their biggest weapon. Their attack, they've always been good at. Mm. I don't think they've ever struggled attack-wise. You've got Geordie Barrett there. I think consistency of Brett Cameron. You know, when Aidan Morgan got his crack, he was great. Um, so I, I, I liken the three areas for me is obviously their type five, their breakdown work with their Lucies, and their defensive system. The biggest thing that I've been impressed with has been, actually been our Safa Moore's leadership in and around decision-making in big moments. Look, you know, sometimes you can take the three points and get a, an easy out. But I think in, in big games and derby games, you know, they, they've had that no-nonsense approach in that forward pack, going to line out malls, going to scrum, especially, I remember in Christchurch against the Crusaders very early on, going for a scrum and then scoring points off that. So I think all those points that, you know, Jip's touched on, I, I completely agree with that. I think the challenge for them is they've obviously lost Cam Roygaard 
who's been a big, big part of that in and around how wide they've played so well. Yes, TJ Pedernal is back, and it's going to be great to see, I guess, the evolution of what that Hurricane side's going to look like. Is it going to look the same? Will it be a little bit off? I think it'll be pretty pretty similar to the way they do play, and they'll continue to have that momentum. But I guess the challenge is for them is, you know, you want to be peaking towards the final. They have, you know, they're, they started at a very high level. The challenge is, the, is for them to come to the final time. So can they do it? And the one thing that I think that they can do it is the depth that they do have. Mm. You look at that Rebels result, they had 14 changes, nothing changed, and you're going to have that competitiveness throughout the throughout the year. And when you come to the finals time, you're not going to be able to choose because your, your group is humming and competitive and wanting to be on the field. So... Yeah, it's 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 very very good a good place to be in Hurricanes headquarters at the moment. You talk about that spine around decision making, but when you can have Armour on the field, a, a Karifi, yep. a Brad Shields, a Geordie Barrett, you know, even your Billy Proctors, um, it's it's pretty professional. And now you add TJ Pitanara in that mix as a leader. And let's not forget when he did that injury, like he was in the ABs and he was playing really well. And 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 off the back of that Rebels performance, whew. Yeah, it was honestly it was like 2016. All the old dogs were stepping up. Brad Shields was huge in that game. TJ, Geordie, it's um, yeah. I think it's a really exciting time for them. If you're going to have a person replacing Cameron Regard, oh. I mean TJ Pedernado for a decade has been that archetypical. Is that a, is that the right word? I don't know if that's the right word. It's a word. It's a um, word. <laughs> <laughs> the running halfback who can also play in other ways and mm. is a great defender fits that system. Fits it massively. And as Bryn said, like, all their players are brought into their system because it looked no different, 14 changes. Um, and the one thing yeah. about TJ, man, he is just, I'd say it time and time again, I've never met a bloke that is more competitive. Maybe him and Rico Ioane are probably on, on even pecking order. Like, everything is, like, to the bus. How fast you can put rubbish away. I, I don't know. <laughs> Anything they are going to compete on and, and they go a hundy at it. So... Um, yeah, I just think, and I think he's motivated. Yeah. Like when he gets that bit between yeah. his teeth and he's motivated, he wants to, you know, a lot of people have written him off, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be mindful of that and he'll want to make a statement. Uh, are they winning those games uh, cleaning up and stuff though? I mean, they're competitive, <laughs> but are they winning the game? It's a very even split and, and they're both very loud. Well, when <laughs> I was around them, they're both very loud that you knew who won, put it that way. Yeah. You very <laughs> and much, if they lost? <laughs> uh, there was just, they were pretty much straight back up wanting to, to do it again. Challenge something else. <laughs> we'll but, keep on playing until yeah, I win. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you must have had a few games like that. The uh, Crusaders, a few guys who are ultra competitive. Oh, 100%. Look, I think just hearing the stories with, with TJ, yeah, he's um, yeah, one of the better competitors, I think, in not just New Zealand, but world rugby with everything, and I guess his mindset when it comes to everything in life. So definitely saw that firsthand on the field. But I think well, he was pretty competitive. I think that guy sitting next to you on the left there <laughs> um, was pretty good in that space. I think he would have, you know, well, I don't think it was all, not all the time, but when he was on, uh, you didn't really want to <laughs> get in a bad, bad way when it came to Big Jiffer. So he's right up there, the big I've, fella on the left. I've simmered down in retirement. Yeah. And having a daughter. <laughs> having a daughter, yeah, Having yeah, to really yeah, take, yeah. really sort of... What do you call it? Sand the rough edges off? Yeah, that's right. A few less golf clubs wrapped around the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just given up golf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is not a sport that is going to calm you down. No. There's no. no way. No way at all. OK, so I've got another question in relation to the Hurricanes because we've been bombarded and, you know, we've got to give you what you want. Michael Williams via email. Based on previous history, we often find that the informed Super Rugby team tends to have more players picked for the ABs. Who do you think gets picked for the ABs from the Hurricanes based on current form? What do you think, Bryn? Guys like Ruben Love, he's an easy pick, I think, with the form that he's had. Um, you've obviously got that loose four trio. Not too sure what raises mix and what he's wanting, but you know, there's probably three or four guys there that you have to be think would be in the conversation to be in that loose four trio. I think within their tight five, look, you've got, you know, you've got Namir, who's played really well. You've got Safa Moore, who we think is probably going to be in, in that mix. Um, you could probably go, you know, Isaiah walker Lee Wedi. He's in that conversation with how he's played in the first, you know, part of the competition. And so, and then you've got the incumbents of like a Geordie Barrett and, um, and, and that. So, yeah, oh, there's a lot. There's a lot that, that, that could make the team. Um, I can't really po probably pinpoint right now who I think is going to be, um, you know, in the mix when it comes to the team naming. But, you know, those guys that I've named and, you know, probably Jib will come over the top with who else he thinks. But there's a lot of them putting their hands up for higher honours this year. Yeah, there's a little bit of a dark horse for me. I think there's the, the, the natural ones you'll lean towards. I think the hard one, before I get onto my dark horse, is 
Karifi, Lakai, Harmon. You know, like there is, there's quite a battle going on. Uh, Christy, he was in the um, All Blacks 15 as well. You sort of know Dalton's going to be there. Um, you know, even to a point, Caelan Boshier's in the mix. So I do find that's quite a hard selection, that, that squad member yeah. seven. Um, so do they go for an out and out seven? Does Ethan Blackheader come back into the mix that he can cover seven and so forth? So that's an interesting one, but I think both Lakai and Karifi are definitely in the conversation for a spot. And then I, I've really liked the work of Caleb Delaney in the second row at lock. Mm. Liking him a little bit to like a Tom Franklin, you know, like he, he gets through his core roles really well. He's a really strong carrier. He's busy, constantly topping the, the stats for them in the middle, in the tough carries, tough tackles, um, and, he, and he's got a bit of flair about him. So, um, you know, he's, he's one to watch, I think, um, in that second row. And, and he may look a little bit smaller, but man, he, he gets through his, his work. Um, with, with physical ease by the looks. And I know international's a step up, but, yeah, he's impressed me. Well, when you look at the locking stocks around the place, how many uh, are probably shoe and how many will remain in the squad, what chances do you, do you see him legitimately of getting a spot there? Yeah. Um, when you think of Lord, Tupovai, uh, Barrett, Tupolotu, it's going to be challenging. Mm. Um, because they've, they've already invested in those guys in the black jersey, but, man, form can't be ignored. And I think it's a new coaching group, um, the, a new four-year cycle. You know, age may come into it, and he's a young man, and um, an opportunity may be given. Or, um, you know, Walker Leoweri has been in the All Blacks 15, so he's, he's an option, Cam Sui Fua. Um, but I just, I, I really like the way Delaney's going about his work, and he definitely warrants All Black 15 selection for me. And it's probably been a question that's been um, answered a lot in probably the past around their tight five. And when it gets tough, for example, when you go down to Christchurch in a, in a quarterfinal when it's wet, you know, doing the hard stuff like Caleb Delaney and doing all the grunt work, um, you know, they're, they're doing that. So the challenge is, is, you know, you're picking up wins and hopefully they can get a home final or a home semi final against a team, you know, like a Blues or a, or a Chiefs or, you know, whoever it may be, a Brumbies or whatever. It's probably that's probably the probably a little bit of an Achilles heel the last two years. They've had to go to Canberra and they haven't had that ability to be at home. So they'll be a different team at home. It's just been able to continue the, the success they've had and um, continue to keep chipping away and see what happens when it comes to the back end of the year. Sure as hell don't want to go to Canberra the way the Brumbies are playing right now. Uh, but when you look at that table, the Blues on 27, admittedly game in hand, the Hurricanes unbeaten on 27, Brumbies on 27, the Chiefs back on 23. And you consider the Hurricanes are hosting the Chiefs this weekend. The Chiefs obviously put a huge score on Moana Pacifica. Do the Chiefs have what it takes to end this run from the Canes? Oh, I think you'd be silly to think they don't with the calibre of player um, they have. And the way they can sort of light a game up, their biggest challenge is coming in and out of games. Like, they can score 28 points within 10, 15 minutes and then they drop off and let a team sort of creep back in. Mm. They obviously did them against Moana Pacifica, but you sort of saw that against the Highlanders. They wouldn't want that performance, um, I, don't, I don't believe. And then obviously the, after the Crusaders game, mm. you know, maybe question marks um, sort of come. But I think there was that stat, not to say that, you know, I thought Josh Shaken was great and the Crusader game you can put to the side, but I think there's some ridiculous stat that Damian Kenzie, when he's on the field, they're like 170 points for and, you know, 50 or 60 against, and then when he's not there, it's like 10 mm. points for and 50 or 60 against or whatever. So he is a key cog, and if he's there, it's a game changer. It's, it's, um, it's sort of like when the Blues went down there. You know, you, you sort of didn't know who was going to win. Most people lent to the Blues. I think on this occasion, everyone will be leaning more to the Hurricanes, but I don't know. Chiefs, Chiefs manner, um, backs against the wall, no one expecting them to win. We've seen them do it in Christchurch time and time again, go down there, no one gives them the chance. So, And Clayton sort of said there's been a few questions had to be said inside after that Crusaders game, and they definitely answered against Moana Pacifica, didn't they? Now, we have got an interesting question through from Fossil Matic on YouTube. He says, wow, if the Crusaders pattern is really what Razor is going to run and the All Blacks around the spine, it raises the questions. Firstly, which player best matches Maunga's profile? To get a little bit into that, we've got James Parsons at the big wall. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, I've done? always wanted to be here. I've just tried <laughs> to manipulate myself in here. So thank you very much for your question. Um, but if we look here, 
it, there's a lot of moving parts to this, but we will sort of single out Stephen Perifetta. If you look there, the first forward pod is set, which engages the defence. More importantly, the second forward pod is set with a player out the back and a threat on the inside. So it's constantly having to make the defence make a decision. The key is what made Moonga so successful. He always chose where the space was. If we play it on now, on this occasion, Stephen goes through, everyone's engaged, engaging those offenders, it creates that space. Now his growth, where Richie was so good, is finishing that off. He, he was amazing. Once Moonga broke like that, he would get through in the try. We saw another a couple of times in this game when the ball comes out the back, Stephen is just getting better and better as picking the opportunity and where the space is to create tries and or sort of big, deep uh, involvements in the back of defences and then they can't recover from there. So I definitely think he fits that profile. And the one thing that I think is more important though is that he has the ball out the back like this and those bodies, if you see that Taylor line just there, that created the disconnect. So those bodies in motion for Stephen from the Blues will give him the best opportunity to be selected for the All Blacks. Bryn, Bryn do you feel like that is on the money as far as how Petafeta might fit into Razor's preferred attacking plans? Yeah, firstly, Jim, well done, mate. Look, that was like NRL Fox <laughs> kind of set up Matty Johnson. So, mate, very well done. Um, and thanks for the question, obviously, with a bit of, um, bit of visual with that as well. So, no, I definitely do agree. I think, you know, the way that the Blues do play with Stephen Perifetta with the image that you did see, um, when you've got guys that are running nice and square and you've got the animation outside it, really, um, Stevie just has to pick the option, which we saw in those two clips. He was able to go out the back, that fourth, fifth defender, go through, or even possibly going the same way, a double pump, and then being able to hit the right option. So, yeah, I think Stevie's doing a really good job with the Blues. I also think Damien McKenzie is that doing that very, very well for the Chiefs. They have a little bit more of a different attacking shape outside that. But, look, I think both those two guys, um, with that kind of DNA of what Richie does out the back, um, we've definitely seen some good growth in the areas from those two, um, those two first fives, I believe. Bryn, do you think they will remain with that shape? I think they will have a, a similar style. I think, you know, like you said, Jip, a couple of weeks ago, you know, Raiders had success with this DNA and I can't put, I don't, I don't see them changing a lot with what's made it made them successful. So I think there might be a little bit of variation outside the pod. So, you know, if there's Damien McKenzie or Stephen Perifet getting the ball out the back, there might be a bit of variation in around that face play shape on the outside of that. So, but I think it'll be very similar to what the Blues shape is because Leon McDonald yeah. obviously did a lot of attack at the Blues and, um, you know, I think, Damien McKenzie, with the way that he's playing, he can fit in really nicely with whatever the, that shape oh. is. But to answer your question, yeah, I think it'll be very, very similar how they run it in the All Blacks this year. It's definitely right up Damien's alley. I've just been asked a lot why I think Stevie is, is a real candidate to back up Damien. Mm. I think Damien's got the inside running, look at the way he's playing. But I think his game is just growing and growing. And that ability to pick the right person, Bryn, or run is a lot harder than it looks. And it's he's he's done at NPC level, but he's starting to do it blues. And if Leon is running the attack, he he is big on his forwards, getting set early and being active right at the line. Like you have to engage defenders so that the opportunity is presented for the first receiver out the back to pick the right option. So yeah. um, no doubt. There'll be some innovation, no doubt, but it will rugby's been the same for a wee while. So if you're engaged, you're you you bring those defenders in, there will be space somewhere. Don't underestimate the people in and around it. Like, yeah, yes, you know, a Stephen Perifetta or Damien McKenzie or Richie Moonga would go through, and yes, they see the space. They've done the prep throughout the week and through longevity of seeing those pitches, they'll be able to do it. But the guys that are running outside the lines, the square um, the square carry with the tip line, you look at that, that clip with, with Jipper, two guys were on the same guy. You know what I mean? So for it all to flow, they've all got to be in synergy and all be on the right page. So you're not going to get it all the time, but you know, if you drive that high standard of being set early, it gives you the best chance to be able to see where the space is and then you can go to the hole and you can also communicate. The second pivot and the two forwards on the outside, which we saw, is really important around giving the comms for that team to have the confidence to say, I've got options or I can see what's in front of me and I can go, go for the line break, which we saw with that, with that clip. So Peter Fett has obviously been a really key part in the Blues' success so far. You know, they are sitting on top of the table, even if it is just because they've played an extra game. The points are there. Mm. The points are there. And, you know, if the Chiefs were to beat the Hurricanes, suddenly, you know, things look a little bit different. Are the Blues rightfully on that top spot? Are they a team that should be considered that partway through the year? Oh, I think the Hurricanes are top. Like, it's ridiculous mm. to try and say they're not after a bye, but they're definitely one, one two, maybe three. 
in, in the top three, definitely. And, and the reason for me, similar to the Hurricanes, is the defence. Like they defended at 94% on the weekend. They've only let in one try the last three weeks. And all the statistical metrics, like, and the Hurricanes stats are a little bit deceiving. They only paint the picture because they shorten up. They do miss quite a few tackles, but they have that recovery, so their statistics aren't as high. But Craig McGrath is the defensive coach at, at the Blues, and I think he's got, you know, he's had these guys for two or three years. They really understand the system. They've got a good sort of foundation. Uh, Vern seems to have brought a sort of a, a tradesman-like edge to them on 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 all aspects of the game, really. But I think that helps in D the most. Like they keep turning up for each other, even when they get broken. That they, they do scramble well. Um, so I do think that defence, well, based on stats, but also based on the fact that they've had the least tries scored against them. Um, that is that is the most impressive part of their game for me. We know they can attack. We know they get energetic. Bodies in motion on attack. Um, the the big part of their game that probably has been challenged is probably line out at times, but they're still running at ninety percent. Um, and their scrum is pretty dominant. Like they've they've been pretty formidable there. And their loose forward trio is similar to the Canes, quite hard to pick, which means it gives you that benefit of the breakdown. Mm. So word on your old mate Offa Tunga Fasi. I mean, he is, it appears to be heading into the prime of his career. He's playing really, really well. He's yeah. been around forever. Yeah, but. Uh, he's still a young man as well in terms of propping states and playing at loose head on the weekend. Like, I still think he's a genuine out and out tight head, but he's really made that loose head position. You know, they sort of moulded him into that Ben Franks role with the All Blacks and being able to cover both sides. And, man, he destroyed the force on the weekend. It was, it was quite a, a, yeah, it was quite quite tough to watch if, if you're a, a Force fan. Yeah. Well, what's impressing you the most about the Blues, Brent? Look, you know, Akira Ioane and Hoskins Institute on the weekend, look, the Grafman work that they did, yes, they can attack. There was abilities where they were on the edge and they were putting people into space. But you look at the work that they're doing continuously, you know, through games, you know, and I think that stern edge that, that Vern's kind of brought in, um, you can see it in how way the Blues are playing. And look, I think as well, the entries when they got onto the 22, you know, they were efficient on the weekend. I could be wrong here, Jip, but, you know, eight out like of six eight. out of six entries. Eight out of a... yeah, eight out of eight, a hundred percent when it comes into the into the into that zone. So in the finals times, if you can have that kind of percentage, which they probably won't against a, a better team, but anywhere in and around a high uh, percentage like they were in the weekend, they're a tough team to ask. They're a tough team to to lose to to beat. Sorry. So yeah, it's really good for the Blues, and I guess they've got a um, very similar to what the Chiefs and the Hurricanes are going through. You know, getting your points, picking them up. Hopefully, the back end of the year, all these things that they're evolving because I think they have been evolving. You know, they weren't. You know, they haven't been probably the strongest team that we've talked around with the Hurricanes and the Chiefs, but they're chipping away, pick, getting at very good areas where they need to in some parts of the game. And on the weekend, you know, that breakdown workers um, and the big boys going to work around the set piece, um, it was really good against the force. Who I thought were actually shocking on the weekend. <laughs> they were horrific. Their game plan, I don't know what they were doing in their game plan. They kicked away everything. There must have been a game plan around like to, to try attack to the 50. But yeah, look, it was... a. Um, yeah, pretty tough watch, I thought, considering their game plan that they kind of brought into Eden Park. The irony is, is the kick stats were 30 to 29. The Blues actually kicked more. <laughs> um, but it's, it's when you don't... We always talk about kick strategy on here, mm. and that was aimless. Like, that was just kicking to just not play in their end. They were too nervous of being turned over or whatever, maybe weather conditions. But you wouldn't have felt the Blues kicked as much mm. as they did because they would be attacking kicks or they'd be to, to put them into field position and they'd be the right kicks based on what the defence was showing you. So again, going back to picking that space, knowing where that is. I think the other interesting point about the Blues is, as we talked about the Hurricane squad depth, but in, and for years, and you know, maybe that's why I've been associated with the Crusaders rugby pod, because I've got so many demons of them doing things so well for so <laughs> long. Um, they, they always had a next man up. If you use Cole Forbes, Corey Evans, you know, Patrick's been coming and going in that locking stakes. They haven't had a settled side mm. and that, their performance hasn't changed. You know, even, if anything, Cole Forbes is shining. Corey Evans shone massively against the force. Um, AJ Lamb comes in, Mark Tlaire's out. You know, like there is a lot of chopping and changing. Um, and the fact that they can keep those standards high, again, is a good sign for them. Um, and, and they're very low in their penalties. Mm. They're not giving teams many opportunities for entries into that 22, which is a big, big part. Now, are you going to give Bryn free entry into the Hoskins Tutu Akira Ioane fan club? <laughs> tell you as what, the president? I'll tell you what, they're they 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 worthy 
men to be uh, nominated from from Brenner, and I'm I'm really happy for him to take the reins of um, some blue support because you know I've I've been jumping on this Crusaders bandwagon lately, you know, <laughs> trying to lift them. I know where they've been. Um, you know, it'd be good to see him pump up a few few hard workers. But I mean, I like what what you guys are saying about Vern Cotter and those two people in particular, because I think the rap on those two people has always been that they're about the flash stuff, but not the hard stuff. Brent's saying they're, they're doing all the work now. So when you combine those two things, you know, logic would say that the world is their oyster when they combine those two things for those guys. And, and the best way to explain that work is probably the Blues counterattack, Brent. And, and look, I'm not name dropping coaches, but Dan who does need to have a pat on the back from the attacking structure and the work he's doing around this counter uh, counterattack. They had 37% uh, territory on the weekend. So most of their tries are coming from deep. Yeah. Same in that clip I showed Stevie, it's come from deep. They work hard back to have more bodies in the backfield so they can manipulate. Yes, they've got some freaks, but even when they don't make that bend, they have that setup that we showed of Stevie and they can still break you. So it's that constant work off the ball to put themselves in position. Maybe check a defender that creates a space for Caleb Clark to roll through. So they're never off. They're always on. And, and, and Akira and Hoskins have been, have been massive in that area. Everyone sees the carries, everyone sees the tackles. But if you actually go to the game or there's a wide angle, look at the work they're doing off the ball to get into position. So often Hoskins is playing that link play on counterattacks that lead to tries. I think Marshy actually um, did a piece on it before the game really well around Hoskins to do his work off the ball. Now, I've got another question for you about the Blues before we move on from the Blues. We've had a viewer question come in from Nick Troon. In fact, we're going to give you uh, the player sport rugby ball this week, Nick, for this question because your two boys play footy and, um, you know, let's give them a ball. I thought we were going to give them the Hurricanes. Nothing to do with this. <laughs> no, we're not going to. <laughs> no, you know, uh, he's got the first half uh, of the show. Does he need yeah, the ball yeah, that's well? true. That's I, true. I don't know. I don't know. The Hurricanes rugby that's pod will true. move on and talk yeah. a little bit about this. Now, Nick Troon, who coaches kids in under 17, under 10s, He's asked a question for us. After watching Super Rugby this season, I'm finding it very difficult to convince myself that I want the kids to mimic the clean of their heroes. Often they don't stay on their feet or support their own body weight. The first two or three cleaners go straight over the top and seal off any chance of the opposition even challenging the ruck. How is this legal? I'm going to pick on the Blues as they seem to be the worst at leaving their feet. Jip, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a two-way thing. Um... Like, there's elements of the defence and the tackler rolling away. And I think we're seeing more and more penalties as tacklers are trying to roll north to south. We know they're supposed to go east or west. Um, and what that has done is you can't, you can't get that low. Like, you actually, mm. but you actually train, and we did the same thing, as, as you sort of put a, um, let's use this as an example, put that as like a tackle bag, yep. and you come in from the side and you, you, you literally train hitting your shoulder and drive. You may look like you're on a flat plane, but you, if you keep your feet driving, you end up sort of back up on your feet. Yeah. So visually it looks. Where I think a lot of players are going wrong, when they um, try to do that, they're skidding. Yeah. And, and or they're so nervous so I'm saying I agree, like, I, I'm not on the blues specifically, but I think in the, in the comp, as, as the whole, is these bodies have been, first few weeks, been flopping back into that half-back channel, and Bryn would hate that, and forwards are tasked with the task, you've got to get rid of that body. And so now people are over-rushing, mm. and the body's not there. So, and I, ha I was surprised, there was a couple of games on the weekend, I was like, man, that is ceiling, I'm surprised refs are letting that go. But I also like that they let it go because no one was there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, I always hate, like, this is where our game's getting better. A little bit of common sense. Yes, in the rule book, they're, they're off their feet, but let's keep the game moving. Like, I do think the refs needs a bit of credit. If there's no one there and they've sealed it, then it's play on. But if there's someone there and they sealed it, then they will get penalised. And I think the refs have got that balance really nice. But I agree, it is a little bit messy. But I think it's messy because of the pressure the defence is putting on. And now defence is changing that picture and people are just sort of overrushing into that breakdown space. Mm, mm. But as a forward, you've got to understand the pressure they're under. If they miss their clean, it's like 
you, you, you won't play. So you know, there is a genuine desperation to get there and move a body and or seal that ball. So if you're Nick and you're trying to coach kids how to approach a clean and these kids are watching the clean on television, what would your advice be to a person like Nick who's taking young kids through that? I always think of it, um, we also did this drill that helped me. I don't know if this is right, and nor or should I be giving out coaching advice <laughs> <laughs> live on television. But you have the if you have um, a tackler and a guy with a pad on the inside, a guy with a pad on the inside, uh, outside, and then you have a ball carrier and a cleaner and a cleaner, and they're clear that if they're going to do a tip or he's going to carry or it's an inside ball. But it's then once they've made that decision winning that race into the space, not necessarily going off your feet, but you're winning the, winning the race against the bags. Yeah. So the bags are always going to dive into that rocket. So 3v3 drill. So it's literally like, okay, what are we going to do? And then if we are tip, who's going to get the outside guy in? And you can train scenarios, and all it is about is winning the race. You've just got to win the race. Like, get in that space. Yeah. Where we've got in trouble, and why he's seen it, is the person that's tackling him is rolling on their ball. Yeah. And players have got to the point where it maybe hasn't been penalised that much and they've taken it into their own hands. So it would be an opportunity, it trains both sides. The tackler can roll out east to west, trains um, guys to get in to have a hunt, and it trains the guys with the ball to be really clear on what carry they're going to do and how fast they can get in there and win that race. Mm -hmm. Did I do that well, Bryn? I was just about to say, man, I, uh, well, I didn't do a lot of cleaning out of my time, Jip, so <laughs> obviously you've asked the right question, I asked the right man. But yeah, but if we, didn't, yeah, I think it's... if we didn't clean out, you had a problem. <laughs> Oh, mate, well, geez. I think, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I asked halfbacks when we were referring, like, getting the ball out to Richie. If, you know, if your forwards are a second late and you've got a jackler like Dalton Papali or Karifi or Co on the ball, it just slows down all your momentum. So winning the race is always a big message in and around our forward pack. You've got to win the race. You're not always going to get it right. I think probably that's the scenes that you do see when guys are just flying in to be able to try and win the ball because... And in all, in all, in all honesty, you need to get that ball out. You need to do whatever you can within the rule, within the laws, within the rules, to get that ball out. It's not just the Blues. Look, the Chiefs do a really good job at it as well. I think um, Ross, you brought up a point around. I think one of the emails was that you know sometimes they take them off the ball, they tackle them onto the ground, maybe a meter or two meters past the ball, and sometimes that's not penalised. But the balance of what the refs are doing, and I think officiating it are really good. Because sometimes I think another example is that where I think the refs refereeing it really well was when it's a fake hunt. You get guys that are going for a fake jackal and people are flying off their feet, but because they've pulled themselves out, you can hear the the refs communicate, no, nah, you've pulled yourself out. That's not a penalty. Where sometimes if you're, you know, if you just watch a rugby for the first time, you're thinking that guy's flying off his feet. Why is that not a penalty? So I think the refs, I agree with Jip are doing a good job around that. So, and I think it's just on the players really to roll away or like win the race is probably the most important thing when it comes to the breakdown. I think like if we go, we I'm, I'm loving to get off my seat. Well, and, and get the legs but, out as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But say, like, um, that's the ball there, and this is the tackle um, tackler there, and your ball carrier's here, and we say, let's just go through three scenarios. Because I'm just thinking, this guy's going to go and coach this, and it, I don't want it to be average. <laughs> so my OCD's coming out of me. Um, and this guy beats into the space. If you're within the metre, they can clean that person. Yeah. You don't need, necessarily need to be off your feet. So if you're thinking win the race and he beats you there, then you move him. If you win the race and um, he's, he doesn't beat you there, he's probably not going to hunt. So then you've got the option to stay on your feet like that or as you've seen, people pick through the middle. So there's easy ways for them to train sort of different um, options and making better decisions around that breakdown for young kids that I think if you can learn to sort of take out Sorry, player sports, but <laughs> you've had enough action today. Um, if, you, if you can um, learn to make better decisions around that breakdown, you, you're going to see these pitches earlier, which will make you win the race because you'll instinctively get into those spaces. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's, that's how it's Player done. sports. That's how it's done. I'll tell you what, Jeff. I'll tell you, Jeff. I'll tell you what, mate. You have been on fire today. Yeah, I'm thriving, not surviving today, Bryn. That's what happens when the Blues build on a performance like that. I just got to spring in my step. They sit top of the table, oh. high in the seat, and yeah. 
It's all looking very good. So thank you very much to Nick Troon for your question. We'll get the player sport ball out to you as soon as we can. <coughs> and anyone, if you want to send us a question, email us at aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz and we'll try our best to get it into the show wherever possible. Maybe include where you're emailing from as well so we've got an idea of where you're from. Of course, you can do it in the YouTube's comments section as well. So thank you very much to everyone who sent those through. I want to move on now to the Brumbies. The reason I want to move on to the Brumbies, guys, is that at the start of the year, they didn't look like much. And right now, they look a million dollars. And as you mentioned earlier, the last thing you'd want to do is to head to Canberra come playoff time. They haven't, they haven't sold me. They haven't sold you? No, and I know that's going to be a little bit of a rattle of the cage, but they defended at 78%. You're not going to win this competition at 78% defence. 27 missed tackles. Yes, the Waratahs couldn't take advantage of it. Totally understand that. And, and they're, they're, as I sort of mentioned with the Hurricanes, is, you know, like their scramble D is good. And the, and the Brumbies scramble D is good, but the Hurricanes are sort of at 86%. You know, like 78? Like they've, they've spent a lot of time. Like if we go Moana Pacifica, 77%. So it shows the difference of scramble. Like Moana Pacifica couldn't scramble and, and cut off the points. But that... That's not going to work against the Hurricanes. That is just not going to work. Yeah. Like defence, I believe, and I think it's been like it for years, defence will win championships. If they don't sort that out, you can't win this comp, whether you're at home or not. 78% is not good enough. They've got, they've got a few weeks to get that done. But they, they've, they've averaged like 81, like through the, like, mm. they've only had one or two games in the 80s. Like they, they, against the Rebels, I think they were 74%. You know, like, these are really... Like, this is the Brumbies. Like, we compare them to the Crusaders. Like, they have been the figurehead of this competition. That is not a standard George Smith would take, I can assure you. Yeah. He would make it personal. David Pocock, Stephen Moore. There's no way that... Mate, review with them with 78%. Struth. Well, Stephen Larkin's on that list of people um, of great yeah. Brumbies. Well, he's a good he's attacker. He's a good he's attacker. He's a good attacker. Was he a defender? I don't know. <laughs> George Gregan, obviously. Oh, I'm just saying, like, crew, the yeah. way they won that game against the Tars was, was pretty amazing for how poorly they defended. One-on-one mm. -on -one tackles. Yeah. Their system's not a problem. One-on-one -on -one tackles. So if they shore that up to high 80s, mm. they're a chance. But as it stands, I mean, they get to the semis. You know. Mate, against the Canes, 77%, 78%. It's just you will not, if, if it's not Yolse, it's Love. If it's not Love, it's Proctor. If it's not him, it's Barrett, Shields, TJ. Like, this, if there's space there, these, those athletes will clean them up. Brian? Their draw's been pretty easy. Like, they have actually played a lot of teams that have been on the bottom half of the competition. So, yes, they are picking up wins, and, and so they should. You know, we, we, think, we think the Brumbies are probably the best team on Australia. They've been a successful team throughout a long period of time, but they have had the easier side of the draw. And I think in the back end, when they start playing the New Zealand teams, especially the, you know, the Crusaders, um, the, who else, who else they're playing, they've got to play the, the Chiefs again, the Blues, I think. So they've got a bit of a, a litmus test coming up pretty shortly. So, yeah, I think their defence, like they can attack, but you've got Tool, obviously they're at their back three. Um, you know, they can go to their set piece as well when it goes to their more, which probably hasn't been operating like we're, which we're accustomed to seeing, but they still have that DNA on the attacking side, which Stephen Larkham is, is good at. It's their defensive side that if you're going to operate in the, in the 70s against the New Zealand teams with the firepower that, they've, that, they've, that we've seen with the Chiefs and, and Co and the Hurricanes, yeah, good luck to the Brumbies if they're going to start defending at that kind of percentage. I'm just reading my notes I wrote during the game. Is it amazing scramble or poor attack? The Tars only had 44% possession and they had 16 turnovers. Gee whiskers, that's a lot of turnovers for so little time on attack. Yeah, yeah. I sound so brutal on yeah, them. It is brutal. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> it I'm was, enjoying the brutal honesty. It was, they are currently third on the table. And Mate, they're doing they're in well. A position to make a big play if they can do well through that back half. And I think all they've got to do is shore up that D. Yeah. If that can be more consistent. The other Aussie team that's looking uh, <laughs> looking really good is the Rebels <laughs> who beat the Drua. But again, they've also got a back half of the comp that you would not want to go into, mm. where they've got all of the top Kiwi sides on the way home, basically. <clears throat> it's pretty tough. For the squad they've got, they're doing so well. The pressure they're under. Like, and the, the lightning hot start that the Drua had, yes, the red card, you can, 
you can say that's one thing, but I wrote down how many penalties the draw had. 16 penalties. Take the red card out. Like, 16 penalties. Mm. That is just, like, you see, it went up to Mick Byrne, and he was just like, <laughs> he just looked gutted and deflated, eh? Like, I was just like, oh, poor bugger. I've got a soft spot for Mick, but, um, and it ruined my picks. But, yeah, they did well to come, they did, did well to come back um, from, from that start. Yep. The draw were pretty dominant physically. Mm. Um, and they actually, the Drua had 61%, which is the highest I've seen in the, in the male game for a long time of game line percentage. And, and the Rebels going into that week had the better dominant stats of the comp. They were number one in terms of those physicality stats. Um, so two big sides going together and the Drua still won that battle, but their discipline just killed them. Mm. Brent, as the chief of the Rebels fan club, well, what's your thought? Oh, look, no, they... Um... I mean, that, 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 I guess that second half, you know, you look at the yellow card, really, the, to kind of start the snowball effect for the Fijian Drua, unfortunately. Um, you know, they scored, you know, three tries, 21 points of that yellow card. But to their credit, they've done it a, a few times this year where they've, you know, they've let out a bit of a head start with the other teams. But through the resilience and I guess, you know, I guess the care that they have in that team, maybe playing for a bigger purpose than themselves or, you know, what's what's ahead, um, they're finding ways to get back in the game. Because when you whenever you have game line percentage, and, you know, they're at the top end of the competition around that. You're going to be able to get the likes of Ricardo Gordon and obviously Vaihu, who I thought was great on the weekend with his with his attacking ability that he showed. And, you know, I think the physicality around it, if you can do it more consistently, and yes, it was a bit of an easy run because the Fijian draw discipline was was pretty, it was pretty horrific. It was, pretty, it, was, it, was, it was really tough to watch for, um, for them, knowing what was on the line. And we backed them and saying that, you know, they're going to turn a corner. And after the first half, before it all happened, they were doing it. They were 20 to point, 20 points to eight up. And I thought this is nice. They're having a bit of continuity. They're getting points where they need to. And then just some brain brain explosions. Unfortunately, that's all you can really call it. And to the to the to the credit of the rebels, they went over the top and the, knowing that they probably should have, knowing that you're playing with 13 men for yeah, the majority of that second half. But yeah, fair play to the rebels. And hopefully there's been obviously a bit of investment in them. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ross. There's some bidders who are, a consortium I think is probably the right word, who are looking to move them to Western Sydney, where there's a larger Pacifica community more attached to rugby than maybe the central part. You know, there's obviously those rumours as Melbourne. well. Western Melbourne, sorry, you're right, Western Melbourne. And uh, then there's also all that chat about whether Moana Pacifica and them could merge. I don't know how those things correlate, mm. but there's a lot of chat about them. But it sounds like with $30 million to come on the table, the debts could be gone and they could have a bit of a future in a place that might make a little bit more sense. Well, and you keep putting out performances and winning games, it makes it more interesting for people to buy and invest into. Mm. Um, I don't think, like I think Moana Pacifica is standalone. I don't see that merger happening. So it's either this or probably bust. They do struggle to fill a stadium, I suppose, similar to a lot of Super Rugby teams, mm. struggle to fill a stadium. And if they head out west to a stadium that looks like it's going to be developed, the, the home ground where the training facilities are is pretty small at the moment. It sounds like you could get 5,000 people in a temporary stand, but with the long-term view to build a 15,000-seat stadium out in that part of, of Western Melbourne, there could be an option my, there. My f um, good mate lives in Melbourne. Melbourne's so big. Like, maybe actually yeah. moving it away from that stadium, Amy Park. Because a, a lot of the barriers is getting in there. Mm. Like, their public transport's amazing and stuff, but it's a long time. Like, I think when I caught the train to his house, it was like an hour ten. So that's, that's like going to the Tron and, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, like, that's a, that's a heavy-duty haul. And if you've got young kids and stuff at that time of night, like, it is a bit of a barrier. So maybe this brings it closer to the rugby community. Yeah, and, and when a community can own a team, it makes a big difference, yeah. right? When it's not so much owned by the entire city or by some sort of business, it's mm. owned by the people, then, you know, there's a bit of a chance there. So well, hopefully that's good for the Rebels and for Australian rugby in the future. Let's move on, though, to Super Rugby Opiki. We have the final this weekend, the big final of Super Rugby Opiki. The Blues are going to be hosting the Manawa after Matatu came through with a big win on the weekend, that late try, Liv, Mc, Liv McGovern coming That's through the gap and, and changing everything and giving the Blues the chance to qualify top. Bryn, Matatu did it. They, they did what you needed them to do. They came through for you. Um, and it leaves the Blues maybe as the team to beat. You know, I could probably speak a little bit wrong here, but I thought the Chiefs played it quite tight. 
in the last 20 minutes. Look, I thought, you know, the um, the impact of what the Mata 2 bench coming on, look, I thought, you know, Maya Joseph was great in around a few attacking kicks that they did. And, um, and I think, you know, also their, their dominance around their forward pack. I thought both teams actually physicality-wise, it was a really great game to watch, you know. One team had their moments, one team had their moments, and it was a really great, um, great game when it came to the contact area. But I just think in that last 20 minutes, you know, the turnovers that I guess the pressure that um, Mata 2 were putting on um, the Chiefs, they weren't able to hold on to the ball. Mistakes, um, discipline, and those kind of things, um, they weren't able to get out of that kind of um, that snowball effect of of what they were in. So, I think they will review they will review hard, knowing that they do have a final. But look, the Blues team, oof, geez, that eight that they have, look, man, they've got a very very impressive four pack. So you look at the collision area that happened in the area of too, I think it's going to go up another level with the ball carriers and the way that they um, they attack their breakdown defensively as well with. But their forward pack, you know, well, who was it? You've got Ngano, Itinu, Vipolo, Makari, Tu'u, Ruz, Vilakot, you know, all of those skills, man. It's like a it's like a brigade that's just coming at you for 80 minutes. So yeah, it's going to be a great game. And you know, obviously, Jip's going to be looking for the Blues. So it's yeah, a good, really, very good watch. The, the key thing for the Blues is I feel the script's flipped a little bit mm. in terms of um, expectation. So it's always been on the Manawa. You know, constantly, like, they're expected to win. Um, I think Blues in the home, that weight of expectation and how they deal with that. They've got the game, they've shown it. They went to Hamilton, they were disciplined. They had 13 um, turnovers versus 26. They cut the offloads, they went direct, threw them, they challenged them at line-out time, which, again, proved a big um, area of concern for the Chiefs on the weekend. So... They just need to stick to that. They need to trust that it's worked and just keep being consistent in that. Their discipline was very good that day as well. Um, they brought that line speed pressure. Sylvia Brandt got that um, nice little intercept. So they've been becoming more confident of leaving the outside um, defensively. Where the Chiefs will be dangerous, I, I believe, um, if they sort their line it out. Um, their, their discipline, they, they gave easy outs to the Mata too to just have the ball back. Um, and I suppose... Under pressure, they tried to play a little bit too much. Um, and those turnovers, like 16 turnovers, just from a statistical point of view, for the standards they've set previously, um, you know, they're, they're in double figures for penalties. They I think they're averaging, when they're just winning games, they're averaging like five. You know, there's a big difference in that. And the turnovers as well um, are, are a lot higher. I, I suppose the only concern I had was they actually had to win by a bonus point, the Chiefs. So... They had to score three tries more than the Mata too. So even if they won, the Blues were going to host it. And they took a penalty shot in the second half when yeah. they weren't tries up. And it didn't matter if they lost. Because mm. if they lost or they didn't score the bonus point, you know, like I just, I just found it strange. And then from that on, then there was a turnover. And then Mata too went down and scored. Had they... But this, they'd lost confidence in their line-out and their set piece. Which has been their strength for two years. It's been their weapon. Yeah. And, and I think it's what they've got to come up with this week is, yes, Connors wasn't there. I ho Hopefully Bremner's there, Chelsea Bremner's there, because it seems to be she's the one that is obviously running everything and it just, it is, yeah, it just did not execute two weeks in a row. And, and I know what it's like when you get the ips at line-out time. There's, there's nothing worse. It's like golf. Like, the harder you try, the worse it gets. So somehow just sort of, as Bryn always says, simplify the menu. Mm. And I really liked how the Blues walked in and went line-out time. You know, a couple of times they just walked in, beautiful throw. Um, that's maybe something that, you know, remember when the Chiefs men were struggling and Brody Retallick used to sprint to the five and they'd just get up and go or they'd throw it to Brad Weber and... You know, like maybe just be a bit innovative so they can get some confidence back in their lineup. And then get going. Well, it was an absolute cracker of a final last year when Matatu got up over the Manawa. Going to have a slightly different coverage for you this year. A really good chance. So, Two Degrees are proud sponsors of Sky Super Rugby Opiki teams. But thanks to Two Degrees, it's a world first. The Sky Super Rugby Opiki final against the Blues and the Manawa will be streamed vertically on TikTok. It's a little bit different. This Saturday, April 13. The campaign is fighting for fair by giving women's rugby the national coverage and broadcast exposure it deserves. So jump into the Two Degrees TikTok and check out that for more action. Plus, see the big final this Saturday, of course, on Sky Sport New Zealand TikTok 
or on the big screen if you're watching on Sky. But thank you to Two Degrees for doing that. It's a really cool, different way of doing it. Really looking forward to seeing what a rugby game looks like in vertical. Probably helps that there's not a lot of kicking, mm. so you, it, it's a bit different in, in the women's game. But I think um, my exciting aspect of it is to see the amount of engagement, mm. to be honest, because you are going to be touching an, a new fan, a different way of uh, engaging people into our game. So I think that's, like, from my point of view, I think that's most exciting to sort of see out the back of it. I know they'll see a great game. Yeah. Blues, you know, going real well. <laughs> that, that, that trophy's going to fit perfectly in vertical, isn't it? <laughs> it's going to be so That's much fun when I get to interview all the Chiefs players afterwards and they've won. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> don't smile. Whatever yeah, you do, don't yeah. smile. Brenna loves a TikTok dance. You're going to be on TikTok watching that at some point, Bryn? Yeah, not definitely not TikTok dance, but, um, yeah, I'll be definitely watching that on TikTok. That's Are cool. you on TikTok? No, my, my, my lovely partner is, so oh, I'll be yeah. having to grab her phone on the old TikTok, so thankfully I can I could do it here. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm too old. Just when you know, I don't even have TikTok, so it just shows how how far behind I am when it comes to <laughs> the young people in New Zealand. The <laughs> young people, just the basic coverage for us, mate. <laughs> yep. Sport, can't go wrong with Sky Sport. Can't go wrong with Sky Sport. <laughs> Absolutely. And speaking of which, let's go to our tipping competition to finish off the show. Only four games this weekend. Of course, go to tipping.super.rugby, go into our league and you see how we're going. It hasn't been the best week for, for all of us. Uh, Owen Carroll well, remains out front three of out of three. Yeah, the top guys are all four out of four. They were breaking they away. the Rebels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... I'm average this year. <laughs> Let's go straight to our tipping. Moana Pacifica versus the Reds. 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 Bryn? Yeah. Reds. Okay. Waratahs at home against the Crusaders, Bryn. What do you think of that? We had the Waratahs are going. I'd probably say the Crusaders, but we've seemed to lose them the last couple of times. So, no, I think that the Crusaders will come back. I think they'll... Um, They'll have a good review and hopefully there's a few guys that'll be coming back and um, you know, getting some good minutes and hopefully um, they can start the Australian tour with a win. So yeah, we're picking the, the Crusaders against the Waratahs. Yeah, I'll go Crusaders. Crusaders, that's the big game. The Hurricanes against the Chiefs, Hurricanes at home. I have to go the Hurricanes just based on form and I don't know, it's just hard to go against them at the moment. Mm, mm. I can't wax lyrically about them for an hour and then not, not pick them. Yeah, the Hurricanes rugby yeah. pod is going to be yeah. picking the Hurricanes this yeah. week. Bren, are you on board with that? No, I'm, I'm going to go the Chiefs. Yes. Yeah, that yeah, would I'm put go the, Chiefs. the cat amongst the pigeons because the Chiefs would then jump up onto 27 or 28 points and this looks a little bit different, doesn't it? Especially with the Blues and the Brumbies having the bye. Mm. So. What happened to all that chat, though, about the good leaders and, you know, like, the, you know, they've got all these players and... <laughs> uh, what, we did, what we did say that the Chiefs when they've got their backs behind the wall uh, against the wall I feel a Friday night tip change <laughs> Friday night tip change <laughs> <laughs> we're coming next week Hurricanes in and Bryn's got them all right uh, uh, yeah. Bryn, you're, Bryn you're Rebels on the up at home against the Highlanders no I've got Highlanders. Highlanders get the Highlanders to win I keep picking against the Rebels but they keep killing me <laughs> yeah so um, Rebels at home for you no, nah, absolutely not. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go Highlanders, but the, I'm not going to be surprised if they ruin my weekend again. <laughs> <laughs> they are physically dominant. That's my only concern there. They are. They win a lot of those dominant physical stats. So yeah, that pack will need to be up for it. Well, the Rebels need those points now with the back half of the season looking a little bit Mate, tougher. Highlanders so they'll be fired up. The Highlanders need... They, I mean, they're just scraping in at the bottom of the eight, mm. aren't they, on 11 points. So um, they could be lucky in that the team's below them. But the Crusaders, the Crusaders mm. might come through and, and tip them up and get that bottom spot. And who knows what's going to happen with the Drua who are in seventh. But either way, thank you very much for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Please send us an email, aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz. Get into the comments section. We'd love to engage with you uh, throughout the weeks. Thank you very much for viewing us again. Again, James Parsons, thank you to you. Thank you. Bryn Hall in Japan, off to training. Go have a good one. And thank you, finally, for joining us once again this week. We'll catch you next week. Don't forget, you can catch Aotearoa Rugby Pod on Sky Sport, on YouTube, on Rugby Pass TV. You can catch us all over the place. Appreciate your time. Matewa.